to see you all. Come on in, have a seat. All right. We have several announcements. Today is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, ladies who are mothers. And we are still on the theme of commitment, making a plan and putting it into practice, sticking with it. Just, you want to come up and lead us in our memory verse? We have a memory verse every month, and this month the memory verse is found where, Benny Boo? First Timothy, that's right, 4-8. Jess is going to lead us in the motion. Here we go. is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. For a yes. Wow. I like how you guys emphasize stuff. That's great. It's like you really mean it. And Kendra's like this, life to come. <laughs> she really meant it. All right, women, it is the tea party this Saturday. So uh, all of the women have been assigned to tables. You, I think most of you should know where you're sitting. If you don't know what table you're sitting at, see me, and I will tell you what table you're sitting at. But um, if you so choose, you can dress for the theme of your table, but it is not mandatory, it's optional. Um, the only thing that is mandatory is that you do wear clothes. We ask that you wear clothes. I know, right? No, please, you can have show up in your underpants, but make sure you have clothes over them, okay? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. For, all right, so ladies, 2 o'clock next Saturday. Thank you for all of the women who are hosting a table. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. And there won't be any child care. No, no child care for this event. Yep. All right, let's see what's next. Pasta night. Woohoo! We just had our tamale fest yesterday. Wow, it was amazing. It was amazing, we had a wonderful time. We were here all day. We had, Rich taught like three different classes. He cooked uh, like 859 tamales. And yeah, it just was an all day event, but we had a wonderful time. Tonette led us in a game, and we, we just loved every bit of it. So we're gonna do another uh, dinner this month, May 31st, pasta night, my favorite night of the year. And last night, my mom made a bunch of quick breads, banana bread and pumpkin bread, and she sold them for $5 a loaf. We made $150 for the church by her doing that. So if you would like to buy a mini loaf, there's, I think, about six or seven loaves left. They're $5 a piece. You can buy one today. If you haven't gotten your mother a Mother's Day gift, they even have a little bow on them. So... And Donna said, by the way, that was the best pumpkin bread she ever had. Right, Donna? That's right. So she goes, who made that? There you go. So if you want the best pumpkin bread that Donna's ever had, you can buy a loaf. All right. But on, Italian, on uh, pasta night, we're going to sell Italian sodas. So bring a little extra cash for that. Go back one slide. There we go. One, four. There you go. And I, under the stars, our gala. Did anybody take one of the sheets back there that has a uh, basket auction basket items on it? If you would like to take one of these, it gives you an idea of some items that we're looking for for the auction. Um, I would encourage you to do that. Thank you very much. And I think that's all the announcements. Any bur yes. Come on up. Get out of the way. <laughs> um, there you go. <laughs> uh, the uh, youth group had planned a fishing outing this coming on the 18th. Um, we are looking at possibly, well, we're looking at moving that to the free fishing weekend, which makes more sense with getting licenses and everything. So John and I talked last night, and we're looking, I think that is the 7th. 
uh, it'd be the 7th of June. Of June. Okay. Is that okay. A Saturday? It's a Saturday. Okay. And we may move the time at 9 o'clock to a little earlier just uh, to yeah. catch more fish. I yeah. think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The 8th. Oh, the 8th. It is the 8th. Yes. Thanks, John. Okay. Is that what your watch says? That's what my watch <laughs> says. <laughs> I like your watch. <laughs> All right, um, any birthdays, anniversaries, sobriety dates, celebrations of any kind? Just for today? Oh wait, what? Did you have a birthday? May 10th, you had a birthday. Sandy, did you? Oh, you had a birthday too? Oh, 84 years young, I like that. That's the right attitude and that's why you're young. Let's sing happy birthday to these two girls. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Thank you for being born. Let's worship the Lord, amen? We're in the house of the Lord, and we're not going to be quiet, are we? No. No. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. And we were the beggars. Now we're we were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing it again. We were the beggars, and we were the beggars. Now we're royalty, and we were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely in this place and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. One more time, we shout out. We shout out your praise. Amen. I love you crazy kids. You little crazy nutsos. It's good to be crazy for the Lord, right? 
Amen.
just sang another song take me back to where we started i open up my heart to you sing i'm sorry i'm sorry when i've come with my agenda i'm sorry when i've got the jewelry Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence, and I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Sing, I'm sorry. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry. I forgot that you're enough and take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Sing, I'm caught up in your presence. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Sing, I never want to leave. I never want to leave. Sing it again. I never want to leave. I never want to Father, we just are so grateful to be in your house this morning, to be in your presence, to just worship you. Father, we ask that right now you would be with our children as they go next door, that you would um, speak truth to their hearts, help them understand the Bible and how it applies to their lives. And we pray the same thing for us, Lord, that as we read the word of God, we would understand and that we would know how to apply it. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, kids, are you ready for Sunday school? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me, yes, yes Jesus, Jesus loves me, me. Yes, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. All right, uh, it is Mother's Day, 
And uh, we have gifts for all of the mothers who are here. And John and Jessica and Katie are going to come forward and help pass out the presents. She didn't know I was going to call on her. If you're a mother, can you please stand up? Please stand. Grandmas, if, well, if you're, a, if you're a grandma, then you're a mother. So stand up, gr grandma -ma moms. Thank you, mothers. Thank you, thank you. We're going to bring you a gift. And it's for the million things she gave me. Oh, means only that she's growing old. Aren't we all? T is for the tears she shed to save me. H is for her heart of purest gold. E is for her eyes so bright and shining. R means right and Thank you, right. Jess. She'll always be right, Mom. Put them all two together, they spell mother. The word that means the world to me. Well, happy Mother's Day. We have a cute little video. We're going to wait for everyone to get seated so that we don't miss all the cute little sayings. Happy Mother's Day Thank you. Thank you. Did you get one? I can't hear you. Who made the balance? I had two lovely volunteers, young ladies, come in this week who helped me. My mother and... Um, one of our advisory board members who uh, from the community came in and helped put them all together for me. So all of the all of the bows on your bag were handmade by Jessica and I, and we stayed up late, 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 two days in a row making those. So you can take it off. You can, uh, you can put a little pin, safety pin on the back and you could attach it to your purse or whatever. Your hair, they made hair bows out of them in, in craft class. So happy Mother's Day, everyone. There's thought and love that went into each of the packages. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if we can uh, just uh, find our seats, we're going to play the Mother's Day video and uh, just get a cute little... A uh, taste of motherhood, I guess. <laughs> what makes your mom happy? Flowers. When I listen. When I be good or something. <laughs> a hug. Yeah. I don't know. That's too tight. What makes your mom sad? When I don't listen. Oh, I go and get hurt. What's something that your mom does every day? Read the Bible, cleans the house, and I think work. Kisses me. <laughs> What's something your mom always says to you? I love you and brush my teeth. Go clean your room. Behave. Don't let the dog upstairs. Do not bother mom while she's sleeping. How old is your mom? I think five. Twelve. That's a very, very tricky question. Um, I know she's um, a half and something. Seventy. What's your mom's favorite thing to do? Play with me. Sit in that chair. Date night. Shop. Shopping. Go shopping. It's just shopping every day. She always wants to go shopping. Me and I get tired. Doing that, it's kind of boring. Where's your mom's favorite place to go? Chinese restaurant. An animal shelter. I think it's to the mall. <laughs> go to the restroom. <laughs> How are you and your mom the same? Our hair. Our eyes. We have the same phones. We're really flexible. We both have long tongues, but my sister and my dad don't really. How are you and your mom different? Our eyes are different. The color of me. I'm brown and she's tan. Mom has curly hair and I have straight hair. I do have better abs. What's your favorite thing about your mom? That she doesn't like to be away from us. When she gets down the floor and plays with me. She's a really good teacher. I like her face. Her smile. When she lets me put on her makeup. That I can cuddle with her. 
at night. She is really special. She's really, 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 really nice. How do you know that your mom loves you? She prays and she kisses me and she says I love you. Who she's in my family. How she takes care of us. By making breakfast, do my laundry. That she helps me get dressed. Yes. Takes me to all the things I do after school. That she plays games with me. Play soccer with me. Play bubbles. When I sit in her lap. We watch movies. We get our nails painted. Make a scrapbook. Fish. Outside cookouts and bonfires. She spends time with us and not all by herself. She's patient. With us. She does everything with me. Because she says it every day. She says me every night. And all kinds of stuff. I just know that she loves me because she says, I'll always love you. She's awesome. She loves me no matter what. Like God. I love you, Mommy. Happy Mother's Day. That's right. So everyone can tell my son it's proof that when I kiss him, that means I love him. And so he needs to let me kiss him. There's one thing that each and every one of us in this room have in common. And I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that every single person in this room has been hurt by another person. Right? We've all been hurt by another person. Now, it may have been a long time ago. It may have been yesterday. It may have been this morning. It may have been a little teeny tiny thing that hurt really bad, or it may have been a major life-changing big event. But we all carry scars that have come from broken relationships. That's what makes today's encounter with the, with the resurrected Christ so interesting to me. Today we're going to look at the conversation that took place between the resurrected Jesus and Peter following an early morning fishing trip and breakfast on the beach. And as we read our scripture passage, I want you to keep in mind that just a little over a week earlier, about a week and a half earlier, Jesus was arrested and he was taken to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. And that night that Jesus had been taken into custody, Peter had repeatedly denied Christ. He had denied knowing him. We often think of the, the guilt that Peter must have felt, right? When the cock crowed the third time and he realized he had just denied Christ three times, we think of the guilt and the sadness that he must have felt in that moment. But I think an important question might be for us today, how did Jesus feel in that moment? It must have left a scar, literally left a scar. Peter had made big boasts that night. He was the one who said, though everyone else may turn away from you, Lord. I never will. I'm never going to deny you. I will never turn away from you. And Jesus said, oh, Peter, this very night, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me three times. It must have hurt Jesus deeply when one of his closest friends, one in his inner circle, betrayed him. It must have hurt him to the core. With that being said, I want you to listen today's, to today's scripture passage with that in mind. Can we turn my mic down just a little bit? I'm getting some feedback up here. Our scripture is found in John 21, verses 15 to 25. This is what it says. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, 
son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Amen. So as we listen to this intimate conversation that takes place between Peter and Jesus, there are three things that I want to make note of. The first thing that we should make note of is that Jesus forgave Peter. This morning in Sunday school, this exact passage of scripture was being talked about. I don't plan adult Sunday school, okay? So God worked all of that out. And as I'm sitting in my office preparing a few things, last minute things, I'm listening to the guy give the Sunday school lesson, and he's basically preaching my entire sermon. (laughs) And I... I I thought, man, I don't know if I even need to preach today, but I do, so chill out. In In the Sunday school lesson, the teacher talked about how sometimes we don't want certain people, we don't want to run into certain people, right? We don't want to be seen by certain people because they're going to either hold us up in a long conversation or they're kind of annoying or we just don't look appropriate and we're just, we don't want to be seen. And he talked about Peter getting out of the boat that morning and seeing Jesus and how he might not have wanted Jesus to really see him, right? Because of the shame and the guilt that he had based on denying him. Or, in other words, betraying him, right? But I think often we focus a little too much on Peter. And I think I want to focus a little bit on what Jesus did. You know, Peter got out of the boat and ran to him. But Jesus was willing to forgive immediately. You have to remember that Peter denied being a follower of Jesus. Not only did he say, I'm, I'm, not a follower of, I'm not a follower of Jesus, you got me wrong. He said, I don't know the man. I don't even know him. We also need to remember that while Jesus was fully God, he was also fully human. And that means he had all the human emotions that we do. That means that when he got punched in the nose, it hurt. That means when somebody said mean things to him, it hurt. That means when his friends betrayed him and denied him, it hurt. Look again at verse 15. The first six or seven words are the most important in this verse. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter. That's it. That's a sermon right there. Soon as they finish eating, Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. I'm going to feed your soul, I'm going to feed your stomach, and then I'm going to address your soul issue. Immediately after breakfast, Jesus took time to have a one-on-one conversation with Peter to address the elephant in the room, or on the beach. The betrayal. Jesus didn't wait to extend forgiveness to Peter. He didn't sit and stew in his hurt feelings until he was ready to just explode on Peter. 
Nor did he try to punish Peter by making him sit and wallow in his guilt and shame for as long as possible. You know, I'm just going to let him sit in that guilt until I go back, ascend to heaven. He could just sit in it for a while. No. Nor did he try to punish Peter by making him feel guilt even beyond what he was already feeling. There are a lot of responses Jesus could have had to Peter's denial. He could have responded like we do. He could have given him the silent treatment. Ooh. That's a good one, right? He could have given him the cold shoulder. He could have made it crystal clear that he was angry at him and let him suffer. He could have punished Peter in a variety of ways. And every time Peter said anything, Jesus could have raised an eyebrow. If I could raise one eyebrow, I would. As if to say, oh, Peter, you know, I'm not sure if I should really believe what you're saying because, you know, sometimes you say one thing and you do another. He could have said, you know, Peter, normally I would ask you to do this with me, but I'm just not sure I can trust you anymore. He could have excluded Peter when he invited all the other disciples to, to do something. He could have said, hey, guys, let's have breakfast. Peter, why don't you just sit in the boat for now? Yeah, why don't you go clean all the fish? He could have found subtle and not so subtle ways to punish him. And if he ran out of ideas, he could have just asked us because we know a thing or two about punishing people who have hurt us, right? But that isn't what Jesus chose to do. Instead, he got right to the heart of the issue. As soon as breakfast was over, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter needed something from Jesus in that moment. He needed forgiveness. And Jesus wanted Peter to grow from the painful experience that he had. He didn't want him to be shackled by it. He wanted Peter to know that he still loved him. He still believed in him. He still trusted him. Jesus won, wanted Peter to know that he was forgiven. He didn't say the words, Peter, I forgive you. But in a sense, he did. Sometimes those exact words aren't necessary. Sometimes our actions speak louder than our words. And when we extend forgiveness to someone, we need to show it in our actions. Jesus' actions that day on the beach set Peter free from guilt and shame. There's a, a great lesson that we can learn from Jesus here on extending forgiveness to others quickly. There's a, a scripture that says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? How many of us have gone to bed angry? I know I have. All too often, we like to nurse our hurts. We like to nurture them and water them and grow them into bitterness and resentment. Somebody hurt them in the past. I've met people like this. 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And for whatever reason, they have not been able to let that hurt go. Each of us have had people in our lives who have hurt us. They've spoken unkind words to us. Some of us have been cheated financially by others. We've been maybe mistreated by our parents, maybe by our children. We've been disappointed when we've been in a crisis and our friends haven't been there for us. We've had friends who break their vows and their promises. We've had friends who have lied to us and even worse, about us. Every single one of us has a Peter in our lives. Not that kind of Peter, boys. The boys are giggling in the back row. <laughs> How can you, I take you seriously? <laughs> the question is, what are we going to do about those hurt feelings? Right? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to hold on to the hurt, or are we going to be like Jesus and forgive quickly? 
Jesus told us that a person who's unwilling to forgive shows that they don't appreciate the forgiveness that God has extended to them. Did you know that? If you're holding on to bitterness and anger and resentment and hurt feelings and you're not forgiving, then you're not fully embracing the forgiveness that God has given to you. Jesus tells the parable of a man who was forgiven this massive debt. In our days, it would be millions of dollars. But that man who was forgiven this great debt ran into a person who owed him a little teeny tiny bit of money. And what do you know? He just forgave that guy immediately, right? No. What happened? Threw that guy in jail. You owe me 25 cents, dude. Throw this guy in jail. Jesus condemns that behavior. He argues that each one of us have been forgiven a much greater wrong than any wrong someone else could do to us. And knowing what it means to receive mercy, we should be willing to extend mercy to others. If we're unwilling to extend forgiveness, it only goes to show we don't really appreciate the forgiveness that we have received from God. We're also told that a person who's unwilling to forgive is trying to play God, trying to assert God's authority. Listen to Romans 12, 9. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. <clears throat> for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So when we hold on to that anger and bitterness, we're trying to do God's job. Lord, I'll punish him. Don't you worry about it. I got this. Commenting on this passage, author Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, said this. In the final analysis, forgiveness is an act of faith. By forgiving another, I am trusting that God is a better justice maker than I am. By forgiving, I release my own right to get even and leave all issues of fairness for God to work out. I leave in God's hands the scales that must balance justice and mercy. You know, the Bible tells us, tells us that those who are unwilling to extend forgiveness will pay a steep price. Louis Smeads wrote this, the first and often the only person to be healed by forgiveness is the person who does the forgiving. When we genuinely forgive, we set a prisoner free and then discover that that prisoner was us. Max Licato wrote this, <clears throat> in any given Christian community, there are two groups, those who are contagious in their joy and those who are cranky in their faith. I like to call those the joy suckers. They just suck the joy out of the room. They've accepted Christ and are seeking him, but their balloon has no helium. One is grateful, but the other is grumpy. Both are saved. Both are heaven-bound, but one sees the rainbow and the other sees the rain. Could this principle explain the difference? Could it be that they're experiencing the same joy they've given their offenders? One says, I forgive you, and they feel forgiven. The other says, I'm ticked off, and lives ticked off at the world. The lesson we can learn from Jesus about forgiveness is simple. Extend forgiveness quickly. Don't wait. Don't let it brew. Jesus didn't want Peter to wallow in past guilt and shame. He wanted him to get on with the business of living in the present and doing what he had been called to do. Which leads us to the next thing I want to talk about and make note of. Not only did Jesus forgive Peter that day, he also restored Peter. I said in Sunday school this morning, there's a difference between being forgiven and being restored. In verse 15, 16, and 17, Jesus lovingly, carefully, and publicly gave Peter three opportunities. One for each of his earlier denials. 
He gave these opportunities for him to step forward in forgiveness and be restored to service. You see, Peter had been forgiven, but he still needed to be restored. And I'm pretty sure we can all imagine how Peter was feeling as he sat in the presence of the resurrected Jesus. I'm sure he kept replaying what had happened a little over a week earlier as he's sitting in that courtyard. Jesus is being interrogated by the high priest, and he just kept denying Jesus three times. And while he knew that he had been forgiven, I'm sure he was still dealing with a great deal of regret. I know each and every one of us can relate to that. We know we've been forgiven, but we still have regrets. We all have things in our past that we regret. We all have things in our past that we're ashamed of. There are times where I'll think about something that I know I'm forgiven over, and nobody else even knows I'm thinking of it, but my cheeks will just go red because I'm still embarrassed that I ever did that. We all have things in our past that weigh us down. And in Peter's case, it was even worse because he was the one at the Last Supper when Jesus said, you're all going to deny me, you're all going to turn away from me. He's the one that stood up in front of everyone else and boldly said, I will never deny you. Everyone else may turn away, Lord, but not, not me. Uh-uh. We're, we're like close, right? You and me to the end, bro. I'll die for you, Jesus. That's what he said. And they all knew how miserably he failed. And to make matters worse, he's the one that Jesus had renamed. When Jesus met him, he was Simon. And Jesus, immediately when he met him, he's introduced, he says, this is my brother, Simon. And Jesus said, oh, no, you're now Peter, the rock. Listen to this. Matthew 16, 16 through 18. I'm going to read the message version. Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus came back, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You did not get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Peter didn't just need to be forgiven, he also needed to be restored back to the rock. He was the original, the rock. <laughs> and he needed to be restored not just for his own sake, but for the church's sake. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you that I'm putting you back in action. Peter, you have the power and the permission to serve me by serving my people. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed them and follow me. And we know from the book of Acts that Peter did that. He followed him and he fed his sheep and he took care of the lambs. Peter had learned that his past performance had nothing to do with his present power to serve. Let me say that again. Your past has nothing to do with your present power to serve. It's so easy for us to focus on our sins and our failures and our mistakes and our con convictions we convince ourselves that our past performance has guaranteed us the same result in the future. I'm just going to mess up again. Might as well not even try. We become Eeyore. Might as well stay home. <laughs> it's not that we don't think God has forgiven us of those sins. We're just not sure we can be restored to service. Maybe we feel we're stuck in a cycle of despair and abandoned dreams, all because we've had some failures. Maybe we failed at marriage. Maybe we failed our children, our career. 
Maybe we've struggled with addiction or a bad behavior. Or maybe we're just sick and tired of the way that we have these great ideas. We make these grand plans and we have the best of intentions, but we consistently fail to follow through. We just keep messing up. But God hasn't called us to failure. He can forgive us and restore us. He's that good. Right? All we have to do is trust him. Trust that no matter what, our sins and our failures are forgiven. And we can be restored to do whatever it is that he has called us to do. Whether that's raising children, or nourishing a marriage, or holding a job, or leading a church, or getting an education, or witnessing about our faith, or just being a good friend to someone. The guy in Sunday school this morning, I wrote it down really quick as I was in my office, Peter wasn't disqualified because of his denial. God restored him. Jesus didn't only forgive and restore Peter, but he also reminded him of his calling. He said, you have been forgiven, I will restore you. Now let me remind you of what you're being restored to. You're being restored so that you could do this. He did this by spelling it out for Peter, by telling him what he wanted him to do. He wanted Peter to feed and care for what? The sheep. In a sense, we are all sharing that responsibility with Peter. All of us are responsible for caring for the flock of God. Jesus doesn't call us to entertain the sheep or organize the sheep or develop support groups for the sheep or make the sheep feel better about themselves. Well, all that's great and good. Our job is to feed the sheep. Eat the sheep. Eat the sheep. No, feed, not eat. <laughs> Sometimes Christians do that to each other, right? There's a saying that Christians are the only group of people who shoot their wounded or whatever. Uh, you know, it's the, let's not eat the sheep, okay? <laughs> Metaphorically, we're going to feed the sheep and not eat them. Let me point out a few things concerning the sheep. By the way, who are the sheep? Us. Bah, right? First, first thing about the sheep, they are God's sheep, not ours. All of you are God's sheep. And even though I like to think you're my sheep, you're not really my sheep. I'm just feeding the sheep. I'm tending the sheep. I'm taking care of God's sheep. We're not building our kingdom, our church. Whose kingdom are we building? Second, the sheep aren't all the same. Amen. Amen. I love all you weirdos. You're weird in all different kinds of ways, and I love it. And as we care for each other, we need to remember that we are all unique and different. And I love that. Third, we're not only to feed the sheep, but we are to care for them too. It's not enough to simply recite Bible verses to each other. We need to care for one another. Now, I don't know a lot about livestock, but I do know this. There's a lot more to taking care of sheep than just putting out food and water for them. They need help when they're giving birth to their lambs. They need medical attention when they get sick. They need warmth when it's bitterly cold. They need shelter when it's terribly hot. They need protection from predators. It's not enough for us to just go through the motions. We have to roll up our sleeves and get involved with each other if we're going to help each other grow. So when someone says, I'm struggling, I need to move, and I don't have a vehicle to move, and we go, you know what Jesus says in the Bible? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'll pray for you. See you tomorrow. Yeah. You know, I mean, no. 
You did them absolutely no good. You are not tending the sheep, and you're not even feeding them, right? You're actually stealing food off their plate. No one is forgiven and restored to simply sit around. Jesus said, you are forgiven, you are restored. Now, follow me. All Christians are called to serve one another. Peter was sent to feed the early church and to share the good news to the Gentiles. Jesus wants us to share the good news to those who live in our community. The question is, will we do it? So first, Jesus dealt with Peter's sin by extending him forgiveness. Then he restored Peter back to the rock on which the church would be built. And then he reminded Peter of his calling, which was to work on his behalf by tending to the flock. Now, before we wrap things up, I want us to look at verses 18 to 22 again. Very truly, I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Let me just stop there for a minute and tell you what that means, because some of you are probably like, huh? Remember when Jesus was on trial, they stripped him of his clothes, and then they threw a purple garment over him, and they put a crown of thorns on his head? And they led him away to die in a way that he did not choose to die. Well, Jesus is laying out the way that Peter is also going to die. He, too, will be martyred. He will be sentenced a crucifixion, just like Jesus was. Verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. He would glorify God by that death because the reason they killed him was because he was preaching the good news. Then he said to him, follow me. I love this. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, you got to love the relationship between John and Peter, right? John is rubbing it in right here. Then John's writing this book, by the way. And he says this about himself. Then Peter turned and saw me, (laughs) the disciple whom Jesus loved. He saw that we were following. And then he goes on to say about himself even more. That wasn't enough, so he has to add some parentheses. This was the one, me, who had leaned back against Jesus at the Last Supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, and remember, who went all the way to the cross with Jesus? John. Who denied Jesus and ran away? Peter. When Peter saw him, John, the one who followed Jesus to the cross, he said, Lord, what about him? Is he going to have to die a painful death and wear clothes that he doesn't want to wear? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you, Peter? You just need to follow me. Jesus did know that Peter loved him. And he also knew that Peter's love for him would eventually lead him to a martyr's death. And just like Jesus, Peter would be sentenced to be crucified. But tradition says that Peter would request to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. But with this simple command, follow me, Peter would get distracted by the other disciple, John. Ah, Peter, always in competition. Reminds me of someone else I know, Cindy, Lou. Peter saw John following them and asked, well, what about him? What's going to happen to him? But when Peter got distracted by what Jesus might have in store for John, he was told in no uncertain terms, mind your own business. How many of you parents have had to say that, you moms out there, to your kids? Don't worry about your brother or your sister. You just do what I told you to do. Yeah, you're laughing because you know 
It's all too easy, isn't it, for us to look around and get distracted by how God might be dealing with other Christians. We easily get distracted from what we're supposed to be doing by looking at what other people are doing or not doing. But when we do that, we can't we can just imagine Jesus looking at us with disappointment on his face and saying, what does it matter to you? Your job is to simply follow me. Make sure you do your job properly and don't worry about how I deal with other people. The issue isn't about those who have hurt us. The issue is, will we forgive them? Yes. Because if you don't, you're the prisoner. You're the one being held captive. The question isn't whether the other guy loves Jesus or not. The question is, do we love Jesus? The issue isn't whether other Christians are going to do their job, but whether we're going to do our job. <clears throat> Today's message is a message that is meant to be taken personally. So with that in mind, I close with these questions. First, is there someone that you need to forgive today? Yeah. Is it going to be easy? Do you need to make a visit, dial a number, extend a warm embrace to someone you have been at odds with for way too long? Are you willing to trust God and love God enough to let go of bitterness and resentment? Are you ready to be restored? Have you gotten distracted by what other Christians are doing or not doing? Will you examine your heart today and ask, do I love the Lord? You know, Chuck said this morning in Sunday school, makes me think of that, what would Jesus do? And you know, maybe we need to say, instead of what would Jesus do, do I love the Lord? <laughs> Don't be hasty with the answer. Ask the question several times. That's what Jesus did. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Make sure you understand the depth of its meaning. Have you spent all your time playing with the sheep when you're supposed to be feeding the sheep? The call is the same for us today as it was for Peter and the other disciples back then. It's simple. Follow me and feed my sheep. Follow me and feed my sheep. I pray that you will accept the call today. Any comments, questions, or concerns? John and Gavin are going to bring the microphones around. We've got Sean over there. Or John's going to change the camera. Gavin is going to do all the running today. Oh, and David. David, over here, Sean. <coughs> I'm so congested today. Allergies are going nutso. <coughs> A couple of things. Number one, uh, John said that there's a lot of other things that Jesus did, and if it was all included, it yeah. would be. In. I got to believe that even though it's not in the Bible, one of the appearances that Jesus gave after he rose from the dead was to his mom. Oh, I would, I would there imagine. There would have to be a one-on-one -on -one yeah, with his mom. time with his mom. Yeah. I, I, and I would love to have you know, Maybe, been able to see that. Look, word. Mother's Day kind of falls right yeah, around the ascension. Yeah. And the second was <laughs> The first this. Mother's Day. <clears throat> As you had the slides up there, I kept on looking at the word, uh, he uh, forgave Peter, forgave, forgave, forgave. And I flipped it around. He forgave Peter because he gave for Peter. Peter. Mm -hmm. And in the same way as he gave for him, I should forgive others because God has called upon me to give for them. Yeah. Yep. You know, and that, that deals with restoration. Yeah. And that deals with ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm giving for somebody because I love Christ. I'm forgiving him because I want to give for them. That's right. Good. Good. Yep, Susan. <coughs> Dave. <laughs> um, <no>. Me too. <laughs> um, at the uh, Last Supper, P 
Peter bombastically said, Lord, I would die for you. Uh -huh. And then he denied him. And then now Jesus is pulling the full circle back and he says, you know, you're forgiven, Peter, you're restored. And you are going to be able yeah. to die for me. That's right. <clears throat> and Peter did it. And he did it. Yep. Yes. Yep. And he served faithfully all that time, yep. too. Yeah. I, I shared in Sunday school this morning, I, Peter had to go through that pain of the denial in order to become the rock, mm -hmm. right? He was just kind of a pebble before, right? But after the denial and the, the forgiveness and restoration, that's when he became the rock. Don. Somewhere in the 18th chapter of John, I can't remember, but it talks about we have a choice of either manage our life according to God's terms mm -hmm. or according to our terms. Right. Now, if we're going to manage it according to God's terms, we better give up so that we can forgive. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um. Oh, over here. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hello. I've, been, I've been waiting very yeah. patiently to share. When Jesus first called Peter, he was fishing, of course, and Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fisher of, a fisher of men. Mm -hmm. And so his initial call was to be an evangelist. Yep. And he did that very well. You know, that three years that they ministered with Jesus, they were, they were fishing for men and bringing in a great catch. But then when, after... Peter denied him um, in this encounter. Mm -hmm. He says, follow me. And he's turning him into a shepherd. He mm -hmm. said, feed my sheep. He, he still was, had the original call because he was still, after this point, a great evangelist. And he was still fishing for men. But um, Jesus deepened his calling. He, constant, he restored him into not only the, the, the previous calling that he had, but he gave him an addi additional mm -hmm. charge and additional responsibilities. Yeah. And um, he said, feed my, she feed my sheep. And so he you're going to be a pastor, yeah. not just an evangelist, but now you're going to be a pastor as well. Mm. And it was after Peter was his greatest um, brokenness, his greatest failure. Sometimes that great, that when we are most broken, God can use that opportunity yep. to bring us to a deeper place and to a deeper place of ministry than we ever were able to be in before. Yep. Peter could not have been a pastor or a shepherd unless he himself had become broken. He needed to, that failure in his life and, and that forgiveness that was extended to him in order to know how to extend that to others, right? And sometimes I think the best pastors are those who have been through hardships and, and you know, addiction or, you know, broken lives. They've been to jail, they've, ha they've experienced heartache because they've been forgiven so much, they can extend that care to the sheep and, and you know, really understand the people. So not only was he a fisherman, but now he's a shepherd. There you go. Also, there's another issue too that God tells us in his word, if we, cannot, we do not forgive, God will not forgive us. Yeah. We have to have that component. And if you've been hurt terribly bad and you feel like you can't forgive that person that's hurt, hurt you so bad, it's because we think we can't forget it. Yeah, but yeah. forgiveness and forgetting are two different yes, things. Yes, they are. You f can forgive and still have the memory and still know what they're doing, what's happened. But it, it's just a complicated situation. But right. God does the healing when you make the effort. That's right. Very nice, very good. Is that it? Oh, oh, Tanny. So expanding on that, it's a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. When you believe that you have to forgive somebody, but they, on the other hand, don't believe they did anything wrong or hurt yeah. you, Yeah. Mm -hmm. that has got to be the hardest it is very difficult way to, to forgive. Do that. Yep. Because you have to, for I know you have to forgive that person to free yourself. Yes. So you say, like, who do you need to call today or who do you need to tell? I mean, and maybe you can't say, I forgive you. Mm -mm, right. So I guess you're saying you just say, how about we visit for a while? Yeah. Or, and how, how do you? I mean, I would like more advice yeah. or more information on 
yes. when you're dealing with that kind of a situation, right. how would you so advise? How can you help that that's person? That's a very good point. There are often times where we've been hurt by somebody and they don't think they've done anything wrong, right? So if you were to say to them, I forgive you for hurting me, they'd be like, for what? I didn't do anything. So how do you extend forgiveness in that situation? There are a couple things that I've done in the past. One, I actually wrote a letter of, you know, this is how you hurt me, but I choose to forgive you, and I, I burnt the letter rather than send it. That, that was therapeutic for me. It was symbolic of, like, letting that go. Um, another thing is I had a sponsor, and I talked to my sponsor about it, and my sponsor was a you know, sat in for that person as I confessed to them my hurt feelings and my forgiveness. Um, that was another way of, of doing that. Because you're right, at that point, it's not about forgiving the other person. It's about freeing you from the bitterness and anger that can come from unforgiveness. And so it really has to be, instead of making a phone call, maybe you need to spend some time in prayer just giving that to God. There are, it, there are some people that I can forgive right away and move on, it's done and over. There are other people, I've been working on it for years, of uh, forgiving them, and it takes time. And so it might be one of those situations. It, that's the hardest one to reconcile when one person, but scripture also says as much as it is possible with you, live at peace. You know, you do all you can, and that's, that's what you're responsible for. Okay? That's right. The black sheep, right? Those those naughty ones. Those those naughty ones. We know all about the naughty ones, don't we? <laughs> all right, you guys. Happy Mother's Day. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Love one another. Be good, Donna. Be good. And go get your kids.